Uh, we're already recording, but I'll just double check your audio levels if you want to just basically say anything. Uh, anything uh, and anything. Perfect. Right exactly where I need you. Good morning, listeners of Adventures Through the Mind, or at least it is morning for me, your host, James W. Gesso. I'm just drinking some yerba mate here and um, feeling excited and ready to bring you today's episode with Stephen Jenkinson. Any of you who have been following the podcast know the content appears to be reasonably psychedelic pretty much all of the time but every now and then it dips into something something which would seem on the surface very unpsychedelic uh things like trauma things like sexuality but the name of the podcast is adventures through the mind and although although psychedelics are a primary theme the underlying theme for me are things that alter our sense of self and things that alter our sense of reality and things that i guess influence our moment to moment experience um, especially those things that take it off kilter uh, and force us <laughs> force us to come to terms with or even let's say better terminology force us to wrestle with the way things are um, when they aren't the way we want them to be and psychedelics can often be like this so can trauma so can you know the the complexities of our sexuality but also so can today's topic which is death and dying so if there is a topic and experience that we can all relate on, it's dying, whether it be our death long before we are old enough to understand what dying means, or before we happen to witness anyone we care about die, or whether it be the um, the situation that many of our elders get into, which is watching all of their friends die <laughs> ongoingly as they continue to live on. So... Either way, part of being alive is a package deal with the reality that we'll die. And the models we have for dying and the models we have for grief uh, and the models I guess we have for just what it means to what it means to be a, a, a mortal being is poor to say the least in, in our, in our Western culture, uh, here in North America. It's barely talked about. It's in fact shoveled away. And even the idea of saying death kind of is, is almost like a dirty word that we don't say, Oh, that person is dying. That person is dead. We pretend like it's not happening or, um, you know, we try to use euphemisms around it, not say the word. We say that they left. We say that they're gone. We say that they're lost. We say that they've passed on, but we don't say that they're dead. We don't talk about our dead. We don't talk about the fact that we die. And if there is an experience that will fundamentally alter your experience, my experience, fundamentally offer, alter our, our sense of self, it's the news. <laughs> it's the breaking news that we are dying or like a, like a terminal diagnosis or the breaking news that someone that we love and care about are dying. And at that moment, in that point, what do we have uh, in, in Western culture that prepares us for that? What do we have that holds us in coming to understand what the meaning of all of this might be and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves when somebody that we care about is dying or when we are the one who is 
dying? Not very much. Not very much. We don't have very much good info, but there are people out there who are offering, I, I believe, good perspective. And one of those people is Stephen Jenkinson. And his work has been profoundly influential for me, so much so that I was uh, really super nervous when I did this interview, though I don't think you would have noticed if I hadn't said anything. But uh, his his work is just, it's just um, really transforming really transforming for me and many of the people that I know, uh, the way that we perceive and understand death, grief, uh, dying. And uh, I was very happy to, and I am currently still very happy to have him here on the show for all of you listeners. Before we jump into it, though, just like to send a big shout out to my patrons on Patreon, who are the reason I continue to be able to do this while um, nourishing the economic realities of being alive. So thank you very much up here in the screen. If you're watching this on YouTube, you will see some names. Those are the names of those people who are feeling so inspired uh, by what I'm doing that they are giving very generously to the podcast and um, to my larger body of work. So thank you very much. I also want to send a big thank you out to Guillermo, who left a wonderful one-time PayPal donation as a thank you for episode 51 with Tobias Tone about Cambo. So thank you, Guillermo. Much appreciated. Of course, the Patreon and the funding for this show could always be growing, and in fact, it is at less than half of a basic funding goal uh, at this time that I am shooting for to make it economically sustainable uh, into the long term, uh, at least into the next two years uh, as I work towards preparing <laughs> two new books to be released uh, so that I can commit myself to not only the podcast project uh, and my YouTube channel, which you might be watching this on, uh, but also the development of my writing skills to produce these books for you at a very high level uh, so that you can enjoy it. So if you are enjoying the show and have been enjoying the show and the YouTube channel and just so happen to be in this moment spontaneously inspired to take that next step in support and head over to become a patron of mine here, you can do so by going to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso or looking at one of the links that will be available in the description to this podcast, uh, be it on YouTube or any of the other podcast catchers that you might be listening to this on. So without too much uh, further morning ramble from me here, I invite you to please enjoy this interview with Stephen Jenkinson on Adventures Through the Mind. Stephen Jenkinson teaches internationally and is the creator and principal instructor of the Orphan Wisdom School, founded in 2010. With master's degrees from Harvard University in Theology and the University of Toronto in Social Work, he is revolutionizing grief and dying in North America. Apprentice to a master storyteller, he has worked extensively with dying people and their families in a former as former program director in a major Canadian hospital, former assistant professor in a predominant Canadian medical school, consultant to palliative care and hospice organizations, and educator and advocate in the helping professions. He is also a sculptor, traditional canoe builder, uh, whose house won a Governor General's Award for Architecture. Stephen is redefining what it means to live and die well. He was the subject of the feature-length documentary film Grief Worker, sorry, Grief Walker, pardon me, uh, a lyrical poetic portrait of his work with dying people. He is also the author of multiple books, including Die Wise, A Manifesto for Sanity and Soul. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you, James. That's all true what you've said so far. And uh, that's not the only thing that's that's true. That was a, you have quite a long and extensive, beautiful uh, bio that I ha had sent to me. <laughs> It's a taxing bio, I think. I had to, I had to, I had to cut it down a little bit um, because 
uh, just like why I'm going to cut down my own speaking here in about five seconds because I really want to optimize the time here with you. Okay. I want to start off by uh, I want to start off by thanking you for your work, Stephen. I was introduced to it through and like many people, your interview with Daniel Vitalis on Rewild Yourself podcast a few years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, over those years, your words then and the words and insights I have um, discovered through you since then have uh, have gained an increasing place of contemplation and engagement in, in not only my own daily life, but uh, in that of many of my close friends as well. And it has had a very positive shift in each of us. So thank you very much. Well, you're very kind to point that out and let me know because, uh, you know, you have no one has no idea, right? At least I rarely hear about these kinds of things. And uh, I hope you can, uh, you know, hope that's not too taxing for your uh, daily life, what you just described. You know, actually, it, um, it might be but uh it actually it actually feels really good a lot of the um a lot of the feelings that what you what you talk about bring up aren't feelings that weren't there they're feelings that were there for me um and they're feelings now that have a place to exist without a a need or a desire other than an autonomic one to hide them and society often tries to make us feel ill for reflecting on things that are so we'll say morbid um, and letting them impact our daily lives. And um, I really feel like uh, I really feel like the permission to know that it's okay to let to let that change you is um, was really meaningful for me. Yeah, although certainly you didn't require nor did you get any permission for me in that regard, right? Because that's a kind of parent child deal. But, but I think what you mean is there's some kind of corroboration, for want of a better word that that it's, first of all, it's not just you, and second of all, there's a lot of things out there that are passing, that aren't working, and a lot of them that turn into th- the ways we think about ourselves, what our deal is, and um, what we give ourselves to. And uh, if enough people are engaged in something that doesn't work, it's very hard to see that it doesn't work, hmm. right? So there's a kind of madness by consensus that that looks an awful lot like the world I live in right now and uh, and maybe what you've just described is a kind of uh, little fissure in that little little kind of a rupture in the willingness to go simply to go along with it and uh, if I p- played any part in that uh, well I appreciate the acknowledgement yeah hmm. and I uh, I appreciate whatever little part you might have played it actually um, it goes directly into the, the first question that I have with you because there is definitely a collective agreement around certain things in our society and um, in, I guess, the Western secular culture that I was, I was brought up in that uh, upon deeper reflection seem to be abundantly obvious as not working um, for the majority of the people who are involved with those cultural memes or those cultural tendencies. And uh, your work expands a lot through um, culture and society and tradition and the human experience as a whole, but a key theme within that is dying, and, and in particular, what you call dying well. What does it mean to die well, Stephen, and what does it mean not to die well? Yeah, we'll start with the second one first. Um, <clears throat> actually, I'll change your question ever so slightly, which is my Please. want in a way, and you're probably not surprised that I would do so. <laughs> no. And, you know, I, called the, I didn't call the book Die Well, although I did use the phrase from time to time in it. But I called it die wise. So let me let me answer from that point of view, if you don't mind. And first of all, uh, you know, if I'm going to call a book die wise, I'm actually uh, deeply uh, um, advocating for the idea that there's such a thing as wisdom. There's the first thing. And it might sound like a, an overly obvious thing to say. But in the days uh, of, you know, deconstructionism in intellectual circles and other things, you know, wisdom has taken a serious um hit uh, in the last 20, 30 years, particularly anything that participates of a tradition, a a sequence over time of people willing to consider, reconsider, and then live by certain received and inherited things, deeply discredited, it seems to me, in our time. So I'm trying to contend with that by calling a book die wise. So what does it mean not to do so? Well, of course, that became my job security in that business is the unwillingness, the inability, and frankly, the the unimagined possibility that one could die wise. 
So what does it look like? The first uh, um, attribute is that I had to make the case that dying wise was good for you, that it was a doable thing, that it was something to be pursued and learned and to a certain degree endured. I actually had to make the case for that because the default reality of dying, which was the arrangement that was paying my salary, that arrangement basically comes to this. You die however you want. And if you don't want to die, we can help you there too. You have no obligation to die and you have no obligation to dying. The difference between the two being this, in the first case, it's obvious that it, I mean, you don't have to die. You have no obligation to die. But I, in the second case, I'm giving you a feel that my understanding of dying um, amounts to a divinity. It's a, it's a deity. And in that sense, a deeply animate proposition in our lives and a presence that is, has nothing to do with a terminal diagnosis. You know, your, your mortality is not somebody in a lab coat telling you. That's not where your mortality comes from. It's a, needless to say, it's a package deal. And everybody intellectually knows that. But when the rubber hits the road, suddenly it becomes a lifestyle option and not an obligation that you have to life. So, so there's a characterization that I'm saying. So dying unwisely generally took the form of dying when you felt like it, how you felt like it, if you felt like it. And, and that, I don't know if that sounds strange or undoable or just conceptual, but I can tell you, I saw those three exercised every day. The dominant culture of North America gives its citizens out clauses on every mandatory aspect of the cerebral and the corporeal life. That's what, I, that's what I saw virtually every day. And people were rewarded, frankly, for opting out. And the, the current regime that is in, engaged in the beginnings of legalizing euthanasia is engaged in that customer satisfaction proposition. That's where that's coming from. And uh, there may be more to say about it later on, depending on what you want to ask about. But the gist of that observation goes something like this. Euthanasia among its advocates is presented as a solution. Finally, that's what it is, it's a solution. They rarely to say to what, but when pushed, they'll say something about suffering. Usually that word will appear. So euthanasia is a solution to intractable suffering, no, to unnecessary suffering. And then, you do the math on what that phrase actually means, and it means something like this. You have no obligation to suffer. That suffering is not part of the deal of having a body and a, and a consciousness. And that, in fact, suffering amounts to cruel and unusual punishment in a culture that has soporific and customer satisfaction, and you are the god of your own life. You see, so suffering has been horrendously... Um, um, discredited and, and discounted, frankly, from the current order. And euthanasia is there to help with suffering. And how does it do so? It tells you, you do not have to die. And you might think, or somebody listening to us might think that, you know, being euthanized and dying are the quote, the same thing. They're not even grammatically the same thing. They're not even syntactically the same thing. Never mind existentially or morally or spiritually the same thing. Uh, largely because if you, you know, just give me another second on the, on the, uh, the syntax of it, the verb to die in the English language is an active verb by definition. You cannot speak, uh, you cannot employ the verb to die in the passive voice in a sentence in English and make any sense. And yet, if you listen to how people talk about dying, almost uniformly, dying is understood as something that happens to you, not as something that you do. So you see, even, even though the word is there whispering to us, 
with a kind of unwelcome genius that dying is nothing but an active undertaken um, reached for and more or less achieved enterprise uh, North America seems to engage in it as an affliction as a as a kind of retribution of time as a as a smear or a smirk or a um, a diminishment of um, personal um, autonomy and power and things of this kind. So what's euthanasia? It's an ex exercise in self-determination. Well, of course it is. When it's corroborated and endorsed by a culture that is absolutely punch drunk on being addicted to competence, it's no surprise that dying will be gathered into that addiction and the culture will prescribe an, ad an addiction generating solution for the problem of dying. It's called, you don't have to die, you can dial in when and how and where you want to do it. That's not dying anymore. It amounts to engineering the way by which you will be killed, not the way by which you will be died. You see what I'm saying? So I'm not talking about whether I agree with it or not. What I'm trying to do is characterize it in a kind of phenomenological way as it actually plays itself out. So this is the, me beginning to give you the feel of what dying poorly or badly or un, un, unwisely is. Wise dying would essentially take the form of something like this. You understand that your dying, like your life, like your body, was entrusted to you. Not inflicted upon you, but entrusted to you. This is not a feel-good um, prescription. I absolutely agree with that. It's a challenging prescription, but it means for all in, that it's not your possession. And as such, like the earth, you know, like our little corner of the earth here in Ontario or wherever you might be listening, um, these, this is something that is either um, benefiting from being entrusted to us or is enduring our trusteeship. Well, I look around and I see endurance at best, and it's just get worse from there. And I think dying is in the same category as the natural environment. That is, that it's been milked for all it's worth. Everything that could be taken from it has been. It's been Monsantoized, if you'll pardon the fractured word, um, over and over and over again by big pharma. Uh, you know, that's not a matter of opinion. Uh, and uh, euthanasia, I mean, the, the smart money is in the euthanasia kits. I don't know if you know this, but this is where the, this is, it's by prescription now. And uh, provided you jump through a couple of hoops, you find big pharma there to help. And of course they're in medical marijuana too, no surprise, uh, because these are continuities of the same vision that you have no obligation to be dying when you actually are. Good dying then would be a recognition that there's a purposefulness to dying when and how you are. There's a meaning. It's uh, it's not arbitrary uh, because it's not a di your dying is not there for you to dial in. Your dying comes to you and asks things of you. And good dying would be, in part, a willingness to proceed as if that were so, and secondly, to have lived a life that predisposes you to be your dying's servant when the time comes. Hmm. So, <clears throat> what what I'm what I'm getting a sense of is is, and please correct me if I'm mistaken, is that the difference is that um, not to die well is basically to do your absolute best to externalize the agency or not externalize um avoid the discomfort of dying the discomfort of taking full psychological emotional responsibility for this rather difficult frightening and challenging experience that has been bequeathed onto you and ultimately um, setting up a situation where you're killed rather than a situation where you choose to die and that dying well is an active psychological choice that is engaged with a force that is greater than ourselves uh, it's not a bad characterization except the lion's share of dying is not this internal contemplative reality. The lion's share of dying 
is a social and mediated proposition. That's where the meaning of it actually arises. In other words, my way of saying it would be, not only is your dying not your own, but its very meaning, its very texture is a consequence of the family and, and ultimately the social order in which it is occurring, you see. So my way of saying it in the book was that dying well or dying wise is a moral obligation. It's a political act. And it's a fundamentally, in our time, a fundamentally subversive spiritual endeavor. None of those uh, um, attributes, as I understand them, are principally psychological. They are communal, or they're at the level of the village-mindedness, not at the level of the individual psyche. This reminds me of um, something that you, you say in, in Griefwalker, um, speaking with a, a dying woman, something along the lines of the way that you die will be like the how you lay out the how you set up the table for your family to eat at after you're gone yeah pretty much that's what i said yeah yeah she was very concerned about uh, what was to become of her teenage children whether the family would fly apart you know at her funeral and uh, never never seek each other out again and so on because obviously she had been the glue you see and she was re regretting that now that she hadn't democratized the skillfulness of things familial, that they had that they had centered around her. And now, you know, the darkness of that arrangement was coming to call. And so her, her, her greatest fear was, um, it had already shown itself, that um, the people in the family were heading to the four corners, so to speak. They were, they were re withdrawing as she died. And that particular death didn't go so very well, from what I understand, uh, as well. So, you know, her 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 fear was well founded, you could say. Hmm. Um, I have another question specifically about meaning, uh, and I also find myself a little caught up in wanting to go deeper into the rabbit hole about uh, the role. Actually, I think I think it all works. In your book, there's a quote, there's several quotes. Your book has become a haven for highlighted text, underlined words, uh, and, and bookmarks for me. Um, but there's one that stood out to me very strongly. Uh, and it's the quote, the crucible for meaning in your life is how you wrestle with the way things are. Can you, can you unpack this uh, in the context of dying? And what role does our dying and the dying of our loved ones play in the meaning of our lives? Well, you know, let me, the preamble should have been from the beginning and certainly will be now that I, you know, I don't represent myself as the uh, answer guy. And uh, I certainly don't have all the solutions. Uh, what I have, I, I think, is a propensity to be troubled and in some kind of vaguely uh, useful fashion uh, in a way that's eloquent and, and discernible to others so questions are you could say my currency answers i'm i'm not that wild about so having said that um this idea of you know meaning i don't really like to talk about it as an as a disembodied proposition uh i can tell you a story carries it better than anything i could hypothesize about you probably read this too um People are dying, and uh, they ha they come into their dying time uh, virtually transfixed by a fear that is so common from one dying North American to the next that you would think that everybody had read the same book or had failed to read the same book or some other something that would explain why so many people have the same fear, regardless of what their their personal biography might suggest. And it was this. Most people were afraid of the, um, you know, the physical uh, detritus of dying and all of the drug and all of the incontinence and all. And mostly it was pain, though. That was the big one. I'm not saying it's not understandable. And I'm not saying I don't have that myself thinking about it. But I'll tell you this. People were concerned so deeply that they could get no rest at the prospect of writhing in absolute an ardent agony at 3 a.m. with no recourse, no one to call, and even if there was, there's nothing to be fundamentally done. That was their horror scheme. And here's the news. 
it virtually never happened that way. And here's why. Because the physicians, generally it was them, had a degree of skillfulness in managing the pain and the symptoms and so on. That rarely did anyone ever get to the point where their greatest fears were realized. So if that's true, then it seems to stand to reason that if your worst fears about dying never come to pass, and that's at a pandemic level, then good dying would kind of, by default, prevail because the worst fears never materialize. And yet, not only did I have a job, but, but worse, much worse than that, people can, are, dying people are the most heavily sedated sector of the population, heavy, heavy users of antidepressants and the rest. So a simple question begins to rise apropos of meaning, and it's this. If your worst fear never comes to pass, and yet you die sedated, and this is the only way to die, quote, peacefully. I'm generalizing here. Of course, there's exceptions. But if that's the arrangement, then, then it seems to me it leads us to the obvious conclusion that most dying people were wrong all along about what they were most afraid of, which is a bizarre prospect. Because if you think about fear and the role that it plays in people's lives, it's inconceivable that you could be wrong about what you're afraid of. Because fear, you know, functionally or existentially seems to have the role of a kind of, you know, vaguely tolerant older sibling in your life who's whispering to you for your own betterment and for your own sake what you should avoid and what you should pursue. You see, that's, that's kind of the functional voice of fear. It actually sounds like it knows what it's talking about. And yet, I'm telling you that most dying people were utterly and completely wrong. So what did it turn out was their greatest fear? And this is where this meaning part of your question comes in. Their greatest fear was disappearing. Much, a much subtler proposition than writhing in agony at 3 a.m. It was a fear of disappearing. And I mean, in every conceivable nuance of that word, uh, ancestrally disappearing, you know, dynamically disappearing, uh, socially and culturally, dis and, and all the rest. Not only disappearing, but people, people who claim to love you would have a capacity within a year, two years, five years, to live their lives pretty much as if you yourself had never been. That would be known in the trade as oblivion, not death. That's oblivion. Oblivion is a retroactive proposition. It means, it means there never was what no longer exists. And this is what has become of, quote, the dead in an ancestor-free environment called North America. And as you die and as I die, the truth of the matter is we're about to join that faceless, nameless parade heading out of town, the deeply discredited phantoms that we have recourse to by, by, uh, by strange phrasing, almost involuntary, or by um, being led there in moments of kind of spiritual anguish by, um, you know, ceremonialists from, for hire from the third world. It's basically what's going on. So, so where is the, all this meaning? Where is, where is this oblivion? And it seems to me the answer is in the failure of the culture to deeply indelibly educate its citizens as to its fundamental moral obligation to those and to that from which they come in favor of a kind of self-styled, self-determining personal heroism that amounts to being an automaton. And the etymology of the word automaton should raise the hair on the back of your neck because the, literal, the word literally means auto all things self, you could say, and the root word M-A-T, mother. The, to be an automaton literally means to mother yourself, literally to be self-conceived, self-delivered, self-sustaining, and answerable fundamentally only to yourself. In North America, that's a recipe for success, not for poverty. So I'm suggesting to you that the fundamental meaning of this kind of poverty is it's, it's parasitic 
it's vampiric and it seems only to show itself at all in times of real extremis and dying is one of those times so then what are your thoughts how so i'm 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 basically stuck in the exact scenario <laughs> that you just that you just described what is what is the what is the antidote to this and i guess my let me rephrase this okay. stephen what are your thoughts on how we could start to change the way that is showing up in our culture well you know i'll reflect for, first of all upon the question and you can imagine i get asked this um prematurely and preemptorily at, at virtually every time i show up somewhere to talk about these things so there's the first thing to notice as a sort of cultural um space saver or something you would you can actually see that people go very quickly to how to fix which is to say that there is a disinclination that's announcing itself in that question and it's okay okay what's the point what's the merit what's the upside of lingering for any length of time at all over how it is never mind how has it come to be as it is no the north american solution is the next thing rolling in off the emotional or the spiritual or the intellectual or the pharmaceutical uh, conveyor belt you know and and invariably you know most questioners try to turn me into one of those and i said to you earlier i don't have the answers by which i mean this of course I have understandings of what to what's to be done because I'm doing them. I'm not wondering what to do myself. I'm engaged in it and talking to you is one of the ways by which I answer myself as to what are you doing in the teeth of this particularly raging storm. But the first order of business in North America to quote change something is to stop trying to change something long enough in order to have some real earned chops and 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 capacity to know that which you propose to change see slow the hell down is the first order of business yeah but we don't have any time no 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 that's the panting self who wants more oxygen slow down the faster you go the more oxygen you're going to need slow down long enough to wonder where the panic is coming from not to de demand that anybody Who's in, who's in charge or who knows anything can immediately absolve you of the anxiety and now anxiety free you can get your shit together and figure this stuff out you see the anxiety is absolutely mandatory it's absolutely well placed and it belongs in the madhouse of our mortality here in North America today so strangely enough <clears throat> i'd almost i think advocate is too strong but I'd highly commend um, being utterly undone by any kind of serious and sustained consideration about these things. I simply condone and commend it. And I excuse me, I got to cough for a second. <coughs> and I corroborate the the degree of of let's say calculated courage that it takes to be willing to be to have your answers leach through your fingers like sand and your self your self assurance to be the first casualty of thinking big thoughts and the cleverness to subside until it's no longer there anymore and the affable and the and the sort of um one answer after another the palming away of things that trouble you by being clever and obtuse and ironic and you know the standard urban repertoire of the day i mean all of these things should take a hit in the face of what you and i are talking about now and among sane people that's exactly what happens so believe it or not i am told that people are having discussion groups around this die wise book all over the place and i say so what happens in them and they say well it's often quite quiet for extended periods of time and i suppose some people would find that a failure in a discussion in a discussion group but to my mind it's an enormous achievement you know 
white folks in the greater world, white folks are quite famous for being deeply uncomfortable with social silence, as if silence is the unfortunate gap that opens up between episodes of meaning. <laughs> and uh, uh, I mean, dead air is one thing on the radio, of course, but, but real um, abiding silence among, between people is a kind of affirmation, isn't it? It's not, it's not that language is not adequate. That's not what silence means, to me at least. The face of the things we're talking about now, silence is a kind of um, mandatory uh, humility of the spirit, really. And, it's, and it's, it doesn't make defeat a stranger anymore. You know, I'll, I'll finish this part with saying, I wish I had a thought of this, but the truth of the matter is, I think I got it from, uh, from Rilke, the German poet Rilke. And the gist of it is something like this. He said, um, the thrust of being uh, a human is not to prevail, but to be defeated by greater and greater things. And I suppose that's what I'm advocating. Hmm. I, um, I really reflected over the last few days about what I wanted to ask, and I told myself I wasn't going to tell you any stories, but I feel like I feel like I, I should share this one um, quickly because it, it really relates and I'd, I'd love to hear you unpack it. I um, I was watching this TV show uh, on basically Netflix binge and during one of the episodes, a uh, character who at this point I was really deeply identifying with after you know several hours of immersion, his father dies. And his father doesn't just die. His father dies... Um, while his son is away and cannot come and his son is on the phone with his dad and his dad is saying why aren't you here i need you here and he couldn't be there and just like witnessing this and recognizing the um how personally it hits me because i recently moved back home to live here um in kitchener ontario when i was out west living it up you know, living a great life of youthful success and whatever. And the last thing I wanted was to come back to where it was boring, where it was, you know, just family stuff and no, no cultural fun and blah, 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 whatever stories I told myself. But I came back because my sister had a baby and it occurred to me that the last thing I want is to miss out on the opportunity to know my parents um, as an adult, as me as an adult now. And so I, I thought about my father dying and uh, the episode ends on a fairly heavy note and I just became welled with grief. Yeah. And uh, Netflix wanted to start the next episode in five seconds, and I and I, I, did, yeah. I didn't know what to do, but I felt like, and, and actually in, in, in honoring some of the ideas expressed in, in your work and, and in some of my other exploration around healthy emotional processing, uh, I decided just to pause and just be with it. And I began to, I began to cry. I began to cry. I was, I was there. I was I was feeling my dad's death. I was grieving his death, even though he was sleeping upstairs. Yeah. And I grieved and I grieved and I just, I felt almost completely lost. And I just kept grieving. I just kept trusting. And then I felt like, I felt like I had connected with, with the me in the future where my father is dead and I'm grieving him. And that I had connected with him and I was grieving with him. I was taking some of the load off by connecting with him and grieving. So I was grieving in advance while simultaneously I was grieving um, in the present tense. Uh, and at the same time, having connected was almost conditioning my nervous system, letting me know, like, this is what it is. This is what it's, this is what it feels like. And this is what it will be. Um, and so it was almost like I had this trade off with my future self. And at some point I felt like I was going to be completely engulfed by it and I just trusted and I just kept crying until all of a sudden the crying had slipped away and the grief didn't it didn't become gratitude it was always gratitude and it's just that the the hard part of the grief just crested long enough for me to realize how much gratitude I have to be with my with my parents now and have taken the opportunity and, and this is where it, it kind of comes into directly what you're saying is that I shared this with a close friend of mine and they became very distressed for my mental health and told me that they have those feelings too that come up and it distresses them. And they went to see their doctor about it and their doctor said, well, this is actually quite a problem. We can put you on a medication so that you're not so distressed by this. 
Mm-hmm. And this is the end of the story. Okay. Well, <clears throat> the first thing is to say that uh, it's interesting that you've worked out the certainty that is to say that your father is going to die before you. And uh, the, the entire story is predicated on that. You know, of course, nobody knows, right? That is the, quote, natural order of things, but the natural order of things appears when it skips a beat more often than not. Mm. So there's the first thing. You never know. It's true. I've actually spoken with my father about that, and we've both agreed that we would prefer it if he dies first. Well, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, speaking as a father who has kids in their early 30s, I get that. I get that, and we don't always get what we want, as the song says. So, so there's that. And then the second thing is, um, you know, the, the rendering, uh, the way, you know, for, forgive me to respond very concretely to the story that you've told, because I, I don't pretend that I know you, and this does not pretend that at all. But, um, but the notion that in, in the telling of the story, there's a degree of, of mastering the encounter with grief, at least in this telling of it, it's quite palpable. And I would just implore you to consider that grief is not a mastered proposition. I would, I would put it to you something like this. I was lucky enough to have a teacher. You read about him in Die Wise if you read that. Um, and his, I've credited him with being, among other things, a master of tragedy. When people read that or talk to me about it, they think what I mean is he has mastered tragedy to the point where it's no longer tragic. It's, it's you know, it's become some other life-enhancing skillfulness. What I mean, and I still mean uh, to describe him this way, is that he knew tragedy very well. It did not deliver him from things tragic. What it did was deepen his, his encounter with tragedy, you see, not to make it less tragic. And there's something very similar about grief, that an encounter with grief of the kind that you just described doesn't lead you past grief to some kind of marginally post-grief skillfulness that had so far eluded you, such that grief is kind of a little proving ground that once you've proven yourself, you know, no more grief. And I'm sure you will find as the couple of years click past and so on, that the grief will actually deepen. I, there's no doubt in my mind that this is what happens. It's a, it is a, um, it is a hard hard master grief is and it is all about discipline and if you just do the etymology on discipline your 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 heart softens to this proposition i think because discipline has nothing to do with what a parent does to a child it has nothing to do with correction disapproving or anything it's the same root word as disciple and it means something in the order of the kind of rigor of thought and and contemplation and the rest that you more or less willingly take upon yourself in the name of the learning that you seek from the one you propose to learn from. This is the matrix of discipline. And, And grief imposes that discipline upon you in a fleeting way that still leaves it open the possibility that you can can return to normal programming and be the knucklehead that you were before its visitation. And um, there's almost something that borders on the cruel about that, that you can, you can go to the mountaintop of an extraordinary and unsought, you know, rivening of the heart, and then the whole thing can be forgotten. And you can actually, quote, unquote, recover. And if you think about what the literal meaning of recover is, You'd never, you'd never wish it upon yourself to be covered over again as you, as you once were, you see? So sadly, there is nothing indelible or inevitable about an encounter like you just described. This is a, a kind of initiatory encounter that pleads for discipline and for real learning and discernment now. That, that now that that's in the tank, it is not anywhere near an achievement for the moment so much as it's the opportunity to lay the burden of certainty down and to be willing to craft the ability to be wrecked on schedule, you see, and to recognize 
that moments like seeing the real mortality of your father are, that's not just for you because your dad is not a learn, is not a bumper sticker learning experience for you. See, your dad was a lot of things before there was such a thing as you. And it's, it's really challenging for adult kids to re- try to remember that, that, uh, you know, that, that their parents are not the Petri dish for their own emotional lives, you see. And, um, uh, it's the, your capacity to see your father in three dimensions is probably one of the direct consequences of glimpsing what you did, you know, and and, uh, and offering him up, you know, as we observed earlier, to die first so that this aspect of your life could be um, made perhaps much more whole than coming to his death as a child would, which is to be bereft and to be deprived, and to be ripped off, and to be taken from, and stolen from, and, and, and the rest, which is the standard language of loss. That's the conceptual vocabulary of loss, that you're on the receiving end, the victimized end of your parents' own ending, the ending that was there the entire time. And there's, excuse me, there's nothing in it that's personal. That's the hardest lesson I think for a North American to learn is that the, all the big deals of life, not one of them is personal. The more personal you get with these um, signal features of life, the more banal and constrained and throttled they are. And the less kinship you are able to deeply enjoy with fellow human beings and with the made world around you. By which I'm saying this, that it is seems to me to be in the nature of endings of all kinds, that they are the principal midwife of a human kinship with everything in the world that is other than human. Over and above our kinship with other human beings, these seem to be brought forward and asked of us by virtue of the, the uh, imminence of, of endings. And so I suppose you could say, if you are a faithful witness in the latter part of your life, which I'm, I'm working on, and some days I manage to pull it off, then one of the things I achieve in the eyes of others is I advocate endings, I deeply imagine and reimagine endings, and finally, I am endings for those whose day of ending it turns out not to be today but mine does thank you um our time our time here and the rest of the interview is is fairly limited and, and possibly um Possibly it's so limited that you and I will never speak again. Like you had said, there's no there's no guarantee that, that he dies first. There's no guarantee that either of us won't be dead before an opportunity again emerges to speak. Um, and in that's why I'm trying to say it all now. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, in in the in the last few minutes, in the last uh, ten or fifteen minutes, I have I have a question. I have a question about hope, um, and yet at the same time, I feel my question about hope feels it feels really uh we'll say second fiddle to a deeper desire for these last few minutes which is just to ask you in this short moment that we had to learn each other very limited what is it that you are naturally inclined to leave me with here what ending for me and the listeners in this uh in this short interview well i've already done that you know, I don't, I don't wait for the end and then go for the big summary. You know, I, I think you could honestly say everything that you've asked me or, you know, if you've imagined aloud to me, what I've tried to do with each response is to, is to let those breadcrumb, you know, fall from my hand as I'm walking and speaking about it. There's no grand summary for these matters. There is no, you know, secret um, aim that if we get there, somehow all will be revealed. Look, man, this is first and foremost, these are matters mysterious. 
And it is in the nature of mystery that the more you learn about it, the more mysterious it becomes. It doesn't confound your mystery. Excuse me. Mystery does not confound you, provided you're willing to engage it as a mystery. But most North Americans come to mystery as a gap in their information, you see? And then, and then they ask for you know, the likes of me to fill in the gaps, either with summary statements or with solutions or with the you know, five steps, the 12 stages. Uh, I, I'll never forget a woman in Boulder, Colorado shook a copy of Die Wise at me. She shook it at me now and she yelled, I've read this thing twice. I still don't know what to do, she says. As if, you know, somehow my obligation was to absolve her of all uncertainty where life and dying is concerned. But I have no obligation to that. My obligation to you uh, is to respond uh, to a fellow human being who is at least flirting with the idea that there are, there are things in life which will be bigger than anything he can think about them. And, you know, what do we do in the face of this stuff? And the answer is take a knee, you see, find some humility, right? And, and no dying to be the God that it is. It just as I'm looking at the river outside my house right now, as we speak, and it's immense in its way. And it's a beautiful uh, fall day. And, you know, what am I? I'm lucky. Uh, and merit doesn't seem to cover my good fortune. You know, I, I've worked hard, yes, and all that's true, and I'm enormously complimented by you being in touch with me and imagining that something I might have to say could be useful to yourself or whoever listens to you. But at the end of the day, the good fortune principally, I'm on the receiving end of it, and I can't account for why. And those days, they're numbered too. And, and when the good fortune ceases, at least in the form that I know it to be today, is this when the grudge match is on again? Or is there something about the ending of good luck and good fortune that's the rest of fortune? And it seems to me the answer is yes, that's what it is. And, and to be a grown up means to know that, that your days are far from assured. And, you know, in, in, a, in a culture that is so enormously self possessed, to know that most of life is not you or I, or what we think of it, is in, can be enormously reassuring and, and put the emphasis on the right syllable, which, which is something like, it is one thing to be grateful for what benefits you, but it's more of a reflex than it is an achievement. The deeper achievement amongst human beings is find some gratitude for that, which appears not to benefit you in the very least, where you can say amen to some mystery story that has not left you out. You know, that's what I'd wish for you and I both and for anybody who's overhearing this. Well, thank you, Stephen. Um... Perhaps then, since that was clearly not the end, as um, there is obviously no big summary, I'll ask you one final question, which will be my end uh, for this interview. Okay. In Die Wise, one of the sections explores hope, uh, and you call it a mortgage. You proclaim the chance to die hope-free is what dying people deserve. Can you elaborate on this, please? I can indeed. Uh, I have some practice with this one. <laughs> well, you know, in the business, people were consistently trafficking in the content or the object of hope. And hope in and of itself was always advocated. I never heard it challenged. I never heard anybody worried about it. If people were hopeful, then on the you know assessment form, on the tick box that said hopeful, yes or no, they always got a yes and everybody was happy about it. It fell to me to wonder not about the content of hope or the object, but the consequence of being hopeful. I just started to wonder, but I don't know why, but I did. And as I did and as I observed the consequences of dying people being hopeful, almost uniformly, I saw a kind of misery that was almost epic as a consequence. Because there is something in the, 
in the nature of hope that turns people away from the present and obliges them towards a mythic or more preferred future. And the dynamic, the kind of existential dynamic of hope is intolerant and future um, besotted virtually. So what I ended up doing was pleading with dying people to give up on hope in order to be able to die well. Where, and in order to do that, I had to separate them because in the popular culture, one begets the other, you see. But if you hope you're not going, you, if you hope you're not dying when you are, what kind of good death is available to you? That's like hoping you're not pregnant, but assuming that the child that at the, the birth will work out. Well, it's madness, you see. So hope is a, you know, you think about how a mortgage functions, ask your dad if, you're not, if you don't happen to have one. And, and the principal dynamic of mortgage is that it forbids you to engage in certain things, not financially speaking, I'm talking about. Uh, and you forego being able to spend that money now because it's all going to the bank or the mortgage company. But the idea is in the great by and by, you will outright own the house and then apparently all will be well. Meanwhile, it's a half life in some fashion or other. And hope functions virtually identically from what I saw. So the strange proposition is not to be hopeless, which is the other side of exactly the same shenanigan. The proposal I made was to proceed free of the obligation to be hopeful or hopeless. It's not realistic. It's to proceed in hope's absence. And I could leave you with this, not my words, but uh, the words of an extraordinary writer, uh, an Irishman, Samuel Beckett, who said, uh, who wrote a book whose title, uh, the book's impenetrable, frankly, but the title is Immaculate. And the name of the book is, I can't go on, I'll go on. No punctuation, no conjunction, straight through from beginning to end, you see, and no qualification either. And that seems to me to be advocating a kind of almost blistering willingness to know things for what they are. And they are two. One is there's such a thing as I can't go on. It really happens. It's not a failure of the will. It's an absolutely accurate response to what can, what can come down the road in one's life. The rest of the book title is I'll go on. He does not say I can't go on, but I'll go on, yet I'll go on, or I can go on. There's no, there's no argument in it by which I believe he's saying that these things are both deeply, accurately true of human beings. The inability to go on and the going on, you see. So without the argument, what do you end up with? You end up with a statement that is less poetic than his title, but it goes something like this. Sometimes in life, and perhaps your dad's dying day will be one of those days when you will go on not being able to. And they'll both be true at the same moment. Realizing that ahead of time, that's grief. And that's what binds you to the rest of us. Stephen, thank you for these little breadcrumbs. Uh, whether you knew it or not, they have been very nourishing. I, uh, is there any way that people listening can learn more about what you're doing or engage your work more deeply? Any uh, suggestions on where they can go to figure figure that out? Well, yeah, of course, the, the proverbial website is it's always there. So, so there's that, which is orphanwisdom.com. And then and we, I happen to have been touring with a band. If you can picture me doing what we just talked about, with a band uh, in concert form. I can't describe it to you, but we recorded it, and lo and behold, we got a CD coming out on the 29th of this month, and, uh, and we have a little concert to release the thing. So there's that. It's called Nights of Grief and Mystery. And then uh, next late spring, early summer, I'll probably have a new book coming out. I've written a book about uh, old, O-L-D, elderhood, and uh, it probably embodies more of what you and I talked about than Die Wise could come close to because 
Diewise was fairly concerned about the specifics of dying, whereas this new one is really concerned about the specifics of living in the presence of what I was talking about in Diewise before it comes around. So between those two things, which are in the offing, and uh, you know, I I travel around a lot, and I I probably could be coming to your town. You never know, and uh, and life so far is pretty kind, and it's kept me healthy. So. Uh, uh, the Orphan Wisdom site has the whole event section where, you know, where I'm touring and I'm leaving, I think, the day after tomorrow, going to New York and then to the West Coast. And, and these things, uh, the invitations continue. So I'm very lucky. And uh, and that's the easiest way I would say. And it's not the <laughs> it's not the most exciting or the happiest way to engage these things. But it might be something that can sustain a little scrutiny. So, uh so there's that. Well, I'll make sure for the listeners who are probably, uh, if they've listened to the episode or the podcast before, they're familiar that all the all the links that you've mentioned will be available at the show notes for this episode over at James Jesso, sorry, jameswjesso.com. And uh, I actually, I can imagine you in concert. I went to your Nights of Grief and Mystery in Toronto uh, oh, about yeah. a year ago with a, with a good friend of mine and her and I are in talks of possibly making the long drive to get out to see you on the 29th of October as well. Right. Well, listen, with no hype involved, if you're going to do that, you better might want to get a ticket because uh, and there's only about a hundred of them and uh, lion share of them are gone already. Well, it's the next thing I do after this interview is done, I think. Okay. James, thanks so much for your time. Man. Thank you for your time as well, Stephen. All right. Take care. You take care as well. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, I followed through on my word, actually, and immediately after that interview got my tickets to see Nights of Grief and Mystery uh, over at Stephen's Farm up uh, up in the Ottawa Valley area here in Ontario. And it was... Um well, it was, it was beautiful, to say the least. I had actually already seen the show the beginning of 2017 in Toronto, but this was a very uh, different quality. We were fed, um, like dinner was a part of it, we were fed there by um, all local and, and locally grown and grown on the farm foods. And there was a lot of people there who were students of Stephen and several people who had just come out of one of their courses at the Orphan Wisdom School. And um, the event took place in this this beautiful schoolhouse with this um, I think they were like carved uh, wood carved mm, what's the word I'm looking for accents uh, in the space and um, full band and it was raining hard outside and we were all together and it was mostly candle I think it might have been fully candlelit and. Uh, yeah, just incredible. I actually, I got the album that he was releasing there, Nights of Grief and Mystery. It is beautiful if you get a chance to listen to it, though, as a suggestion, if you do get a copy of this album, definitely make something special out of it. Don't just toss it on while you're doing the dishes. Bring some friends together uh, and put it on and, and treat listening to the album the way you would treat going to the concert, um, just as a point of suggestion from me because it is quite beautiful and uh, very powerfully moving. Of course, if you liked this episode, you could check out Nights of Grief and Mystery or you could check out Die Wise, Stephen's book um, or his other book, which I've just started so I can't fully recommend, but so far so good. Uh, Money and the Soul's Desire. Um, Die Wise is incredible. So far, Money and the Soul's Desire is quite good. And as you've heard here, Stephen is an incredible teacher. So definitely pick up copies of his book or get a chance to go see him in person if you get that chance. Finally, this podcast and my written work and the various videos on YouTube, as well as my lecturing and the, um, the talks that I go about doing, this is all sort of what I believe is me taking action in the midst of what seems like a seems like a challenged world, I guess. It's uh, in, in another interview with Stephen, I heard him say something along the lines of wait around in a place long enough until you find um, that what you needed to offer was a little bit of sanity, the approximate shape of you. And I guess my work with all of this is um, my 
my effort to offer whatever sanity the approximate shape of me can offer uh, as I go through my own learning journey. And all of this is funded by Patreon and um, by listeners like yourself. So if you're enjoying this content, if you feel that it is meaningful, or you generally just feel like you believe in what I am offering in the world and I want to help empower it to continue and empower others to receive it without um, any required economic investments, uh, please become my patron on Patreon, which you can do by heading to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso, or you could uh, drop me a PayPal donation. The links to that are in the description to this video below. And um, if giving financially is not where you are right now, I completely understand. You can always give with a little social shout out on whatever media network you care about. And of course, subscribe to the show, be it on YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, all the things. Um, so thank you very much for listening all the way to the end here. This has been another episode of Adventures Through the Mind, and I will see you in the next one, episode 60. Take care.